Amen. The audio uh, didn't work for last night, so we don't have that Q&A. So what I wanted to do was actually uh, repeat that question and work through it again, uh, because I think it would also benefit all of us to re-look at this subject. It seems to be one that uh, it is, uh, can be a little bit difficult to, to wrap our minds around. So the question that we are repeating uh, to begin with was a question asked about the role of the King of the South. If we only have um, two powers or groups of people, guards and Satans, and we see these two groups through Daniel, it's highlighting Daniel 2 to 8, um, in this question, though, that those prophecies, then what is this that we're saying about the King of the South and how does that fit into Bible prophecy? So we began to answer that question by looking at uh, what this war actually is, this great controversy between, um, between God and Satan. And we used the same model that we looked at externally yesterday as well, and that is that there is this conflict... In the great controversy, it began in heaven between Christ and Satan. Then it spilled out to this earth. Men sinned. And when they sinned, it became... Now the whole earth, a battleground between Christ's forces and Satan's forces. And we first see those two opposing parties uh, become antagonistic to it, to it, towards each other and begin to clash when we come to Cain and Abel. So now we have begun in heaven between Christ and Satan, spilled onto this earth, and it becomes what we call or term a proxy war between Christ's followers or Christ's kingdom and Satan's kingdom. And it's gone down through the ages just like this. And we see one example of it, our first example in the history of Cain and Abel. We have Cain and Abel, these two opposing parties antagonistic to each other. But as it's gone through history the last 6,000 years, uh, we see um, them, them transform through um, different churches, but really the same, the same church, just different in appearance. So we have God's kingdom for 6,000 years and it can look, take on different forms. It can look like the Jewish Nathan, nation. It can look like um, Protestantism in the, in the history of the 1260 and then it becomes Adventism. But it's one church, God's church for 6,000 years and Satan's church. And God and Satan don't directly fight. They fight through their people. So we saw, we went to Daniel 2. And we talked about the statue. Statue of Daniel 2. Lighting it up with the mountain of Daniel 2. So in Daniel chapter 2 we have these two opposing kingdoms. Christ's and Satan's. We could go to a different one. And if you were to go to Revelation 12, Revelation 12, 6, And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. That's the 1260. It's not a coincidence that it's Revelation 12, 6. It's a 1, 2, 6. So you have a 1260 and you have a woman. So you have a woman in the history of the 1260 in Revelation 12 verse 6 and if you go to Revelation 17 you have another woman 
in the history of the 1260? One woman is clothed with the sun, one woman is clothed with scarlet. So we have again, in, just in the history of the 1260, now the symbols are two opposing women. The woman that flees into the wilderness, um, that for the 1260, and then we have Mystery Babylon, also during the 1260. So throughout uh, the Bible we see these two opposing churches, whether they're represented in a parable story or with a mountain and a, a, a statue or with, um, or with this woman of Revelation 12 or Mystery Babylon. When we come to Revelation, sorry, Daniel chapter 2, this is the statue and this statue is Medo Persia. So Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece and Rome. And this history of Rome takes us all the way down to, uh, to the close of Earth's history. So this covers Satan's kingdom from its inception to its end and each one of these entities is all titled the King of the North. And when we talk about God's kingdom in a relation to a mountain, it's in Mount Zion on the sides of the north. So this is the king of the north and this is the king of the north. So we have a true and a counterfeit king of the north uh, lined up here. We have um, a true woman and, and a scarlet clothed woman. Then we started asking where the King of the South fitted into this picture. So we went back to this church and we recognised that it would have a habit of going into apostasy. We could call that apostasy if we want to take one story, 1850, the later seen condition. Forget their prophetic job function, become complacent and taken over by the cares of this life. When they go into apostasy in 1863, they're scattered. And this apostasy is rebellion to their boss, and their boss is God. So Christ's kingdom down through the ages keeps going through this same problem where they go into apostasy, a later seen condition. They start being distracted by the cares of this life and they fail to fulfill the job functions he's laid out for them. Then we can come to Satan's kingdom and we've been tracing in the early, earlier uh, presentations, we've traced the exact same history. 1773... In 1773, they go into apostasy. We gave some of the history of that. They go into the later seen condition. They're given a choice between um, territory that will be ceded to them that they used to have was taken off them by the kings. The kings say, we'll give it back if you abolish the Jesuit order. So they have a choice between taking care of temporal prosperity and fulfilling the job function laid out to them. They choose to forget their job function. They choose their temporal prosperity instead of they choose their temporal prosperity and instead of controlling the kings and persecuting God's people. And because of that, what happens? 1798, they're scattered. They go into captivity. So they follow the exact same pattern. We come out of captivity under a, a three-step prophetic testing message, so have they, and we, we began to look at that. So we understand that for this structure, this King of the North structure in the book of Daniel, it gives us the pattern that these are all entities where the church rules the state. And how do we show that in the book of Daniel? We went to Daniel 6, story of Darius. 
And what is, what is he to the people? He's king and God. So he kind of has these two, he's being deified, but he's also still king. And as God, he, 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 he makes this decree that for 30 days people cannot worship any other God except himself. So everyone must worship and pray to Darius, not to any other God. Because if you're going to pray to him, it's because they see him as a god. And then he, as king, wants to abolish the decree that he made as god, and can he in fact do it? No. So he, as god, is over or controlling Darius as a king. He has two different job functions. But even when those job functions are blended into the one um, deified monarch, it's still the deity that controls his desires as a king. So this model of the king of the north, all through this history, is church over state. We come down to the woman of Revelation 17, and she's riding upon a beast. It gives us the same story that her characteristics is church over state. We come to the history of the end of the 1260, and that's just what we see. Her job function is twofold. She is to control the kings of Europe and use them to persecute or kill God's people. So this abolishment of the Jesuit order, it was the Jesuits who manipulated and controlled the kings of Europe. So when she abolishes the Jesuit order, what she is doing is submitting herself to the kings of Europe. She's no longer controlling the state. The state now controls her. So from 1773, when the state controls her, it's only a matter of time before the state comes in and completely um, takes her captive. So it's a consistent model that Satan's church down through the ages has this modelling of the church controlling the state. Then we looked at the ge geographical modelling of the king of the south. So if this is the king of the north, it's the king of the north, it's up the top. Down the bottom we have the king of the south. There is no absolute east, easterly point. There is no absolute westerly point. We could just keep spinning the globe, but it spins on two axes, North Pole and South Pole. So there is an absolute south and an absolute north. So there is an absolute king of the north, the United States, and an absolute king of the south, Russia. We, we went back and we discussed the history of Ptolemy. When Ptolemy was the king over Egypt, he em employed a system of agriculture that was almost identical to Stalinist Russia. If you wanted to plant a crop, even just a small crop on your own land that you owned, you ha could not do that without the permission of his officials. And not just one official, it went right up the chain of command. You couldn't even own seed that you didn't receive from the government once, you, once they gave you exactly the portion that you needed of the type of seed or plant that they told you you had to plant and then they would give you the equipment to plant it, everything from your hose to your sickles, everything provided by the government. And then after when you, when you received them, you would receive a sealed letter and then when you had harvested your field on the exact day they told you you had to harvest it, then you would give them back your grain and all of that equipment with that letter to prove that you were handing back everything you had. You couldn't even own your own farm equipment. You couldn't even harvest your crop on the day of your choosing. Under Ptolemy, they had absolutely no freedom. He, he, it's the, the system that Ptolemy set up over Egypt is, um, is compared directly in secular sources to, to um, Stalinistic Russia. Not only did Ptolemy set up a system that was so communistic, he also set up a system of religion that resembles that that we would expect of the king of the south. He allowed a church, but that church he permitted to exist only as they propped up and strengthened his government. So he used religion as a tool to manipulate and control the native population of Egypt. 
again, just as you see in the King of the South. So if the King of the North is church over state, we expect the King of the South to be the polar opposite. And it's the state controlling the church. And even back through the history of Ptolemy, it was that exact model. You come to atheistic France in the French Revolution. First of all, they destroyed the church. And then what did they realise? How do you control the people without a church? So what did they bring back? They might have called her the goddess of reason, but they realised they needed some type of church to control the people. So they brought back a church, but she's set up and controlled by the state. So the king of the south consistently, whether it's Ptolemy or France in the French Revolution or coming down through the history of the Soviet Union and Russia, it's not that it doesn't have a church, it's that this church is tightly controlled as a means of, of manipulating the people. We could see that from history, but we can see that directly on a compare and contrast. Church over state, state over church. I wanted to quote here just a little bit to prove how Russia, how Putin uh, controls through the church. Uh, we didn't do that yesterday, but I found these notes. Putin is being interviewed by someone who agree, has the exact same thinking as him. I don't have the name of the interviewer in front of me. This is typed down from a YouTube video I watched. I gave some of those links yesterday. But the, the fellow interviewing him is a, a Putin supporter, has the exact same thinking. And this... This man says to him, what is the reason for the Trump phenomenon, as you said, in the United States? What is happening in Europe as well? The ruling elites have broken away from the people. There is also the so-called liberal idea which has outlived its purpose. Our Western partners have admitted that some elements of the liberal idea, such as multiculturalism, are no longer, no longer tenable. So I want us to just pick up that last little part when he talks about the liberal idea of multiculturalism. We said yesterday that there are two ultimate white supremacists in the world, Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin. This is why the poles are almost identical. One has polar bears, one has penguins. Otherwise, they look identical. If you were to stand in the center of one, unless you saw a couple of identifying plants or animals that... They, 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 you could easily think, you could easily be confused as to where you were. So Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump, they're almost identical in many ways. And this interviewer supporting Putin, speaking back to Putin, what Putin already believes, is attacking multiculturalism. I just want us to see that. <coughs> Now quoting Vladimir Putin, he's answering him. Russia is an orthodox Christian nation and there have always been problems between orthodox Christianity and the Catholic world. This is exactly why I will now say a few words about Catholics. Are there any problems there? Yes, there are. But they cannot be over-exaggerated and used for destroying the Roman Catholic Church itself. This is what cannot be, do cannot be done. What is Putin defending? He's defending the Catholic Church. He's defending the Vatican. Putin again. Sometimes I get the feeling that these liberal circles are beginning to use certain elements and problems of the Catholic Church, he's highlighting their sexual abuse crisis, as a tool for destroying the church itself. This is what I consider to be incorrect and dangerous. All right, have we forgotten that all of us live in a world based on biblical values? Even atheists and everyone else live in this world. This is the king of the south saying that we live in a world based entirely based on biblical values. We do not have to think about this every day. Attend church and pray, thereby showing that we are devout Christians or Muslims or Jews. However, deep inside, there must be some fundamental human rules and moral values. In this sense, traditional values are more stable and more important for millions of people than this liberal idea, which in my opinion is really ceasing to exist. Of course it's ceasing to exist because you have church and state coming together all across the world. The journalist asks him, so religion, religion is not the opium of the masses? Who said that religion is the opium of the masses? Who first said that? 
Louder. Who said that religion is the opium of the masses? This was Karl Marx, the original founder of, of, of those um, socialist communist principles. Vladimir Putin says, no, no, it is not. So when we line up the King of the South, and for, for many years, people have taught that the King of the South is a, is, has no church that it's just completely atheistic and when they say atheistic they mean opposed to every type of religion but Vladimir Putin is not opposed to every type of religion in fact he's defending Christian moral values as being the bedrock of morality society worldwide why can't homosexuals get married inside Russia because Vladimir Putin would say that's immoral and the morality he's upholding is biblical values. So Russia won't allow gay marriage because they see it as immoral, going against biblical values. That is a church-state relationship. Those who support Donald Trump, they have gay marriage in America thanks to Obama but they would entirely agree with him. This is why Republicans and conservative Christians in America have no problem with the, this close relationship between Trump and Putin because they like Putin. Putin is what they want. They want a president who's going to say we have a, a country based on biblical moral values. Obama would have never said that. They wanted a Vladimir Putin. They wanted a church and state where the state implements the the morality of Christendom and Vladimir Putin in his other quotes highlights uh, this European idea of, of, of Christianity and he, he again within those quotes which I, I'm not going to repeat now refer, refers it specifically also to a white Christian culture so it's the same racism as you see in the north this is an interview with this, I won't say his last uh, first name, it's Russian, Chaplin. His last name is Chaplin. He's the former official spokesperson for the Russian Orthodox Church and he's supposed to be the second most recognised influential member of the Russian Orthodox Church just underneath their Russian patriarch. So it's like Pope second in charge, patriarch, um, Mr Chaplin. The interviewer asks... Mr. Chaplin, what do you think Putin wants for the Russian Orthodox Church? Mr. Chaplin says, power, of course. He says, the very idea of the separation of church and state is alien to the Orthodox civilization. It's a peculiarity of the West. So he's saying that this American idea of separating church and state is a peculiarity you only see in the West. It doesn't exist inside Russia. Inside Russia, it's a church-state relationship. The interviewer. There's another interpretation, a more cynical calculation on Putin's part that he sees the church as a vehicle to consolidate and expand power in the way that he would like to. Chaplin. Well, that's an explanation, but a very simplified explanation that we often hear and see in the West. You don't see it that way? I think Putin needed to adapt to his own people. Lenin, Khrushchev, Gorbachev, didn't listen to the people and they failed. So what he's not denying and very gently insinuating is yes, Vladimir Putin, to have a functioning government, must listen to the people and work with the church. And he says Russia is a church-state relationship. So the king of the north is a church-state relationship, the king of the south is a church-state relationship. But in the north, the church controls the state. Who brought Trump to power? The church. Who keeps him in power? The church. Who brought the Russian Orthodox Church back into power? Vladimir Putin. Who gives them any authority they have? Vladimir Putin. The state controls the church. The church controls the state. Trump is subject underneath the church. The Orthodox Church is subject underneath Vladimir Putin. So someone asked us, took us to the quote of Luke 16, verse 13. 
No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. So this quote is saying, no servant can serve two masters. So if the king of the south is not serving God and not serving Satan, then who else could it be serving? No servant can serve two masters. In the history of 1773, when they abolished the Jesuit order, who is the Pope serving? Is he serving Satan? No, he's in rebellion, yes? Is he serving God? No. Does he become a good person? No. He's still wicked, but he's in rebellion to God. He doesn't become a, a Sabbath-keeping Christian. He doesn't even become Protestant. He's in rebellion to God, and he's in rebellion to Satan. He's not going to keep God's law, but he's going to abolish the Jesuit order and neither keep Satan's law either. So the Pope in 1773 is in rebellion to both masters. All through this history, when you come to the history of Fatima, does the Pope accept it in the history of Fatima? No. Does he become a good person? No. He's in rebellion to his own three angels' messages. He's in rebellion to Satan. He's also in rebellion to God. We went to the quotes... Mark 3:22, starting in verse 22. And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He hath Beelzebub, and by the prince of the devils casteth he out devils. And he called them unto him and said unto them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand, but hath an end. So yesterday in our, in our presentations, we covered the history of 1989 to the Sunday Law. And this is the history of Daniel 11, verse 40. All of this history, part B. 1989 to the Sunday Law. And this whole history is a history of conflict between the king of the now, north who's warring or fighting against the king of the south, yes? So if the king of the north, if their boss equals Satan and the king of the south, his boss equals Satan, what do you call this war? What type of war is this? This would become a civil war. And what Satan has just done, if he's the one that rose up the king of the south, what has he just done? He split his kingdom and divided it against himself. Even Jesus tells Satan, if you do that, you're going to fall. He cannot divide his kingdom against itself. If Satan rises up against himself, if the north and the south rise, if the king of the south rises up against the king of the north, if there's this division in his kingdom, he cannot stand. So the king of the south and the king of the north, they can't have the same boss. They can't be two divisions of one kingdom. Does that make sense? They can't be two divisions of one kingdom. So the king of the south his boss is not Satan. Does that make him on this side of the structure? Part of the mountain, the woman? No, that doesn't make him God's kingdom. So he is in neither court. He's not part of God's kingdom and he's not part of Satan's kingdom. He's a separate entity. Does that make sense? So someone asked the question, Great Controversy 269.1 Sorry, 268.3 Great Controversy 268.3 I'll just paraphrase and get to the point. She says, she talks about the end of the 1260 comes to 1798 
As they're approaching the end of the 1260, war was to be made upon the two witnesses of Revelation by a power represented as a beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit. In many of the nations of Europe, the powers that ruled in church and state had for centuries been controlled by Satan through the medium of the papacy. But here is brought to view a new manifestation of satanic power. So she says that the king of the south, atheistic France, is a new manifestation of satanic power. The question was then asked, if this is saying that the king of the south was essentially another power of Satan's, that it is part of his kingdom, yes? So I took us to... Noah Webster's 1828 Dictionary and we defined the meaning of the word satanic. And what does satanic mean? Having the qualities of Satan, resembling Satan, extremely malicious or wicked, devilish, infernal. So satanic means to summarize all of that just we'll use the first phrase it's having the qualities of Satan so the king of the south is a satanic power because it has the qualities of Satan and what is the quality of Satan if you were to define Satan God's church, his kingdom, serve Christ. Satan's kingdom serves Satan. Who does Satan serve? Yes. Satan, his, he serves himself. Satan doesn't have a boss, does he? He serves himself. So in heaven when he falls, he is a satanic power. The qualities of Satan to resemble Satan is to resemble this. Satan served himself. He did from the fall in heaven for the last 6,000 years. That's his characteristic, yes? So when something has the qualities or, re or is resembling Satan, what do they look like? Who does Vladimir Putin serve? The king of the south has the qualities or is resembling Satan. The qualities of Satan are that he does not have a boss, he serves himself. The qualities of the king of the south are that they do not have a boss, they are in rebellion to God, they are in rebellion to Satan. Because God and Satan both work through what? God works through a church, a woman. Satan works through a church, a woman. And can either of these women influence or control the king of the south, the state power? No. So God can't control the state power, so he can't be their boss. Satan can't control the state power through his church, so he can't be their boss. The state power has no boss. The king of the south, Vladimir Putin, has no boss. He serves purely himself. And that is what it means to be satanic or to have the qualities or resembling Satan. Does that make sense? So as we worked through this, yesterday this is what we worked through in our question and answer session this was the point that we got to recognizing that you can only serve two masters you're either going to serve this one or this one but there does come for some those who serve neither in rebellion to both they serve themselves and we see that in the history of of um we see that in the history of the King of the South, every time it's risen up, it's been in rebellion to both God and Satan. I want us to move and just look at a couple of other questions before we close. So I'm only going to touch on this, but if you went to the Great Controversy, this time, uh, 398... No, sorry. I'll see if I can It's the 
end of the great controversy, it's talking about um, the the second death, that final after the thousand years when God's kingdom comes down and Satan, you, the, you have the mass resurrection. She talks about how Satan starts amassing this massive army of all of these powerful generals, powerful men who've, who've lived for 6,000 years. You would have Hitler standing next to Stalin, standing next to Alexander the Great, standing next to Pyrrhus, every single one of them for 6,000 years. She talks about them also of being generals who've never lost the battle, the men before the flood who were tall and powerful. All of these wicked people who for 6,000 years have been in rebellion to God and they've laid in the grave, they've waited for this moment, they're resurrected and Satan amasses them together to try and bring down the new Jerusalem. And he brings them to the city, this massive army of the greatest warriors and generals the world has ever seen. And what does God do? He unfurls this banner in front of them I really wish I could find it. And he starts... He starts playing a panorama of of Earth's history. Chapter 42, the controversy ended. Nearest the throne are those who are once zealous in the cause of Satan, but who plucked as brands from the burning have followed their saviour, Satan, with deep, intense devotion. Next are those who perfected Christian characters in the midst of falsehood and infidelity, those who honoured the law of God when the Christian world declared it void. So you have finally at the end of the thousand years these two groups those of Satan's resurrected facing each other. Above the throne is revealed the cross and like a panoramic view appear the Satan, scenes of Adam's temptation and fall and the successive steps in the great plan of redemption. The awful spectacle appears just as it was. Satan and his angels and his subjects have no power to turn from the picture of their own work. Each actor recalls a part which he performed. So Herod, he sees the killing of the innocent children of Bethlehem. Hitler will be there. He's going to sit, have to stand and watch the history of the Holocaust and he won't be able to turn away. The slave owners are going to have to stand and watch the, the history of persecution. The popes that killed the, the, the Protestants during the 1260, they'll have to watch all of that. They're forced to watch the work of their own hands. And what does this do to Satan's ki- kingdom? They turn on him, don't they? So Satan divided him against himself, has to fall. And how does the controversy end? Jesus already tells us, if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand but hath an end. When he finally hath an end, has an end, it's because his kingdom becomes divided. His own people turn on him. But that is not the history of the king of the north and the king of the south. The king of the south is in rebellion to every church, God and Satan. This does not make them good people. It does not make them submissive to God as their boss just because that they are in rebellion to Satan. Can we all see that? Has no impact on their morality. Satan is wicked without needing anyone to tempt him. So Vladimir Putin can be wicked without needing Satan controlling him. Do we have any thoughts or questions on that? Or points? So in World War II, for the papacy to resurrect, what does Satan have to do? Who is he working with? Pope Pius XII and Hitler, and what's the first thing they have to do? Take down Stalin. 
he has Satan has to have Satan taken down. If he had have destroyed, sorry, Stalin. If he had have destroyed Stalin and the Soviet Union, what would have happened? Satan would have controlled the world. We could have seen the end of the great controversy. We could have lost the great controversy. All that stood in his way, that that obstacle, was the defeat of the Soviet Union. Why would Satan rise up the King of the South in 1917 if he knows that that power is going to be the obstacle that holds him back from victory in the great controversy? How is he going to work through Stalin knowing that Stalin is his obstacle to controlling the world? He can't because Stalin is wicked, just as wicked as Hitler, without being controlled by either boss. He served entirely himself. Any other thoughts or questions? So that was our revision of yesterday. And how did we finish that end part? Brother Rogers brought up a point about God in heaven. Who does God serve? Us. So who's his boss? <laughs> this was the point that we, we finished on yesterday as we tried to contemplate that thought. And I think that is, shows us the significance of the communion service that we, we just held. Who got on his knees and washed the feet of humanity? Because he who is the greatest is also the greatest servant of all. So no one can be a greater servant than God. No one can serve more. That's what it looks like when you don't serve yourself. That he lives in service to humanity. And so as priests, who's our boss? The Levites and the Nethanims. We live in service. Uh, another question that we have. Why do we keep referring to FFA yet we tell members in the movement not to listen to their teaching? So we keep speaking about FFA but we tell people in the movement not to listen to what they're teaching. So I just want to clarify this point. First of all, is I don't think I've ever told anyone not to listen to what they're teaching. I don't think that's ever come from me. So I think there is perhaps, I know some people are suggesting we don't do that, perhaps um, some more strongly than others, but that isn't something that I have done. I recognize everyone is free to watch and follow whatever they, whatever they desire. As for the reason why we keep referring to them, there's a couple of reasons why why they keep coming up and I, I do want to suggest that they actually don't keep coming up. We have been able through our presentations this week to cover a great many subjects talking about Daniel 11, 40 A and B, 1798, 1989, parable teaching. We've talked about the King of the North and the King of the South. Um, World War I, World War II, the application, the application of raffia. We've talked about a great many things and only a couple of times has FFA been brought up. It doesn't keep coming up because we have a whole message that doesn't require us to speak of them. But one reason why they do come up, why we still bring up this subject is... I'll give one reason first. The reform line of Christ. If we were to do the reform line of Christ, we would take it from 4 BC, yes? From the birth. From the birth of Christ, we see in that first ploughing, dispensation of ploughing, who does that work? 
John the Baptist does that work. Until when? The arrival of the second angel, when? At his baptism? Question, the whole point of this line, what is, what is the work supposed to be? What's the point at the end of ancient Israel? What was the beginning of ancient Israel? What was their purpose? Represent God to the world? Take the gospel to the world? So the end of ancient Israel, their purpose? Take the gospel to the world? We know that the first history failed to do that. So we come to the end of ancient Israel and that finally at the end they accomplish that work. And they take the gospel to the Gentiles. In what year? 34 AD. So 34 AD, the 490 years ends, and this 490 years has been cut off for who? Just the Jewish nation. So all the, just if we look at this reform line, all the way from the birth at 4 BC, all the way to 34 AD, this is all the work within what? Within the Jewish nation, within God's church. So if we apply this to our own time, what is this way, Mark? Sunday law. In the history of the end of ancient Israel, here they go to the Gentiles. In the history of the end of modern Israel, we go to the world, the Nethanims. So all of this from 4 BC to 34 AD is God doing a work for his, his for his church. He's telling us the history that fills in the gap from the time of the end to the Sunday law. So this is the church and the world. Question, the church in how many parts? Two parts. Who is first? First the disciples until until Pentecost so first the disciples are called and trained and then they're harvested when does their time of trouble begin when is their test first group when is the second group called They go back to the church. They might be speaking different languages, but Ellen White specifies these are Jews who have returned to Jerusalem for the feast. So there's the harvest of the disciples. They're called, they're trained, they work under Christ, they walk with Christ, they hear his parables, they learn his parables, they understand them, they through this testing time at Pentecost, they go back to the church from 31 to 34 AD. And then from 34 AD, the harvest of the Gentiles. So the end of ancient Israel models perfectly the end of modern Israel. First the church then back to the church, then to the world at 34 AD or Sunday law. Teaches us three groups. So where are we? We are here, yes? We have just entered a new dispensation in the time period of our harvest. So the reason... Second question, without going through the lines, where are we on the Millerite line here? It's been October 22. So there's a couple of reasons why FFA get mentioned at this point in history. The chief reason is because they are a subject of our reform line. We've just been through this crisis where we've seen Judas leave, we've seen Miller reject, if we were to go to the beginning of earlier history with the um, beginning of ancient Israel, before you come to the crossing of the Jordan, there's the death of Moses. 
You say the death of John. Is Elder Jeff still, as a symbol, John the Baptist? No. He cannot be John the Baptist. As a symbol, John has died. He died before the cross. So you know that he is no longer symbolically John the Baptist. Is he still Moses? No. No. He cannot carry that symbol. Moses died before the crossing of the Jordan. Before you come to the testing of the third, of the first group, these first angels' messages, first angels' messengers either pass away or they reject the message of the second. So the reason that we have discussed FFA in the way that we have is because they are current subjects of our reform line, becoming less current as we progress through the time period of this new dispensation. Also, we still have many people who are troubled or unsure about what side is right and what side is wrong. They're still not settled into the truth. Because they're not settled into the truth, I don't engage in personal attacks. I don't engage in conspiracy theories, both of which are coming out of FFA. I've heard a great many things about myself I never knew. We don't engage in those types of practices that we have seen come thick and fast from FFA. What we do do is come back to the lines and show us where we are. It's a necessity, whether it's pretty or not, we have to know where we stand on a reform line. And on each of these reform lines, they show us who FFA is and what just happened. October 22, you have two groups. One understood and accepted the prophetic testing message and they can move with Christ into the most holy place. One group doesn't. They're directing their prayers to the holy place and who are they praying to? Satan. Satan. You reject the 2,300 day prophecy, you're praying to Satan. There's no point having an advocate in the holy place because he's still both. There's no point having a mediator in the heavenly sanctuary if your prayers can't reach him. If you're praying to forgive for forgiveness and they're going to Satan, there's no point. The door just shut. If you reject the message of the midnight cry and the testing message, they can pray all they like. It's fearful and it's fearful for the people that are still uncertain, still wavering on which side of this issue to stand. So we keep bringing them back to reform lines and you will not see, you will not see FFA or those that follow them work off reform lines structured such as this. They'll cut out a story about two people, a man and a woman getting speared. They'll take it entirely out of the context of its whole reform line where it fits actually at 2014. They'll twist it, force it onto 2019 and say how Parminder and I are two people who 2,000 years ago, Elder Jeff would have shoved a spear through. So they'll give that narrative, that type of prophetic application, but they will not take their stories and apply them to a whole reform line. And we are in a battle over people. We don't want people for numbers, but we want people because we care about their salvation and their souls. That's our job function. We are to serve. So if we want to anchor people in this movement that we believe to be the movement that has God, God has raised up since 1989, we have to take them back to what God taught us in 1989, which was reform lines. They anchored us then, they anchor us now. And whether or not it's the history of the beginning or the end of ancient Israel or the beginning of modern Israel or any of the stories that we take to them, they show us that this movement is the only option viable. I'll give one other example. The history of the Millerites. 1798, you have July 21st, which is a Boston. It's the arrival of the message that's going to swell into the midnight cry, the arrival of the message that swells into the loud cries, the Sunday law. July 21st lines up perfectly with, with the Sunday law. We've known that for a long time within this movement. July 21st, is 2014, which is the Sunday law, something both sides still accept. 
we come to 2019, which is October 22. So we've had July 21st, 2014, October 22, the shut door, 2019. So what do you see between July 21st and October 22, or between, between Sunday law and the close of probation? You see the arrival of a message. It's going to swell until Concord and then swell further till it reaches the point of the midnight cry or the loud cry or 2018 October. So between Sunday law and the shut door, you must see the arrival of a message, it's swelling and empowerment until you arrive to the midnight cry, which is an exact way mark. In the history of the Millerites, this is August 14 and 15. And the message of Samuel Snow. So between 2014 and 2019, we must have this message. And one of the, the other reason why FFA still comes up is because I cannot get my head around why anyone would believe them. Just one reason of many. They still accept 2014 as the Sunday law, but they say there's no external event. They still say 2019 is the shut door, November 9, but they say there is no external event. So they have no ex explanation for the world-changing events, the cataclysmic, um, incredible world-changing events that have occurred between 14 and 19. The world has changed as we know it. They have no explanation. They don't just have no explanation for that. If this is the Sunday law as they claim and this is the shut door as they claim, where is their midnight cry? No, it's not. They rejected that. When is their midnight cry and what is their testing message? What has been their midnight cry message? Because we know what our midnight cry message is. Put yourself in their shoes and what is their midnight cry? They mustn't just have a message, a prophetic revelation. They must also have a messenger to deliver it and a waymark for it. Do they have any of those things? No. no. Can you see how untenable that position is? Every single reform line shows us, whether it's 144,000 priests, Levites, Nethanims, end of ancient Israel, beginning of modern Israel, shows us that at this way mark here, July 21, 2014, a prophetic message begins to open up. That it's going to be swell and delivered at an exact way mark known as the midnight cry. Do they have one? They don't have one. They have no midnight cry testing message, which is why one of their followers, followers got up at their camp meeting and said something that is completely untenable, but a position they've been forced into, which is to say we're in the period of the harvest, but just for our reform line with absolutely no evidence, we're having a harvest, but we had no latter rain. That's what one person taught. And that's what they're... Their only position can be that somehow the first crop in any model of agriculture that we've ever seen can be harvested without a lot of rain. So one of the reasons it comes up is because every now and again it just comes as a fresh surprise how anyone could leave this movement with the weight of evidence we have behind it. And I think the reason they leave is because of fear, because they have been confronted with a message that has required them to unlearn such deep, strongly held beliefs. And because that message has confronted them in such a fashion, and because they do not understand the rules of parable teaching, they're battling to understand and accept where this movement has taken us. Like the Israelites saying, God would not have led, out, led us out this far. He would not have led us this far into the wilderness. 
So people are afraid of how, how far they've been let out. And I think fear is behind much of it. So we keep bringing people back to the reform lines, not to have a go at FFA, not to be mean to people that used to be our brethren, but to try and anchor people in just how strong the evidence is that we are on the right side. 1989 was the opening up of reform lines. Every one of those reform lines locks solidly into place that we are in the history where the first angel's messenger has entirely finished his work and there has been an unsealed message that developed into a waymark known as the midnight cry that people were tested upon and then closed their probation by rejecting or accepted. <coughs> We've been to the quote before, we all know it well. Ellen White says, The preaching of the first angel's message back in this history and of the midnight cry here. Tended directly to repress fanaticism and dis dissension. It was not the pro proclamation of the second advent. It was not the midnight cry message that caused fanaticism and division. What did Elder Jeff do when he attacked this message? It's one of the first statements he made. He said it was the delivering of the midnight cry in October 2018 that silenced other voices and brought about fanaticism. He says that in direct contradiction to the line of the Millerites. All of our lines show us that the midnight cry message could not have caused division or fanaticism. Instead, we saw that when that message was delivered, the voices that were silenced were the fanatical messages given by our, our brother Theodore, who has now sided with Jeff and with others, who were giving a, a counterfeit message of time setting based on numerology and not parable teaching and we began our studies we began our studies together by looking at parable teaching and what did what was the early reign at pentecost parables, parables. so the latter reign parables. parables and what did elder jeff say i reject your parable methodology i'm going to use my old laodicean methodology he said that he meant it sarcastically, but he still said that. So we see a rejection of parable teaching, which was the foundation of the, which was the early reign at Pentecost and is the latter reign also in the history of the midnight cry. Early reign, latter reign. Parable teaching, parable teaching. So we've shown evidence after evidence of how solidly we can place this movement on each reform line that where there really isn't a place to waver until we start destroying reform lines themselves, which is what becomes necessary. You have to destroy reform lines. You have to destroy the model of agriculture. You have to start saying there's no ladder rain. You have to start destroying external events, just saying there's no external events. There's no ladder rain. There is no reform line such as this. There is no history where John the Baptist stops teaching and Jesus comes. He teaches the first angel, goes all the way to the history of Pentecost, and at Pentecost, which lines up Panium, the second angel will come. You have to destroy every reform line to teach that. But because people are so afraid of the message of the midnight cry what was given, they are forced to take these untenable positions that cannot be defended on any reform line or parable taught. Question. Yes. How is parable related to the printed uh, how, how do we see the parable messages that came and see that in the early way that in the early way? I'll just look for a quote for you. Um. <laughs> Sorry, what was it called? HD 267. HD 267? HDL? Oh, sorry, sorry. 8T. 
267.2. So this is a really good quote. 8T267.2. She's talking about Pentecost. And she says, when on the day of Pentecost the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the disciples, they understood the truth that Christ had spoken in parables. So we know that at Pentecost you see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But what does it mean when the Holy Spirit is poured out? We have all these nice phrases like pouring out of the Holy Spirit, tongues of fire, early rain, but what do they all actually mean in reality? And she defines them as in reality what the, dis what the disciples received, what the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was, was an understanding of the truths that Christ had spoken in parables. So they finally understand all of his parables. And this was in our, um, you may not have been there, I think it was perhaps one of our first presentations. We went through particularly Matthew 13, but also I think Matthew 18 and Matthew 25, and we showed how Jesus kept saying all through that, um, all through those chapters, we listed a great number, there must have been nearly 12, Jesus keeps telling them the kingdom of heaven is like the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of heaven is like a net. The kingdom of heaven is like an Eastern European wedding. He keeps saying the kingdom of heaven is like or the kingdom of heaven equals a net or a wedding or agriculture, all the things that they understand. They understand weddings, they understand fishing, they understand ploughing and, and planting. They understand all these stories, but do they understand the nature of the kingdom of heaven? No. no. So Jesus has to parable after parable to start telling them what the kingdom of heaven is like. And when we went to Revelation 13, sorry, um, Matthew 13, 13, 11, he's telling them, he tells the disciples, they say, in verse 10, the disciples come to him and they're saying, why are you telling us all of these parable stories? And Jesus answers and says unto them, because unto you, the disciples, that first group, is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them, the Pharisees, the Jewish church, it's not given. So these parables, this understanding was given to the disciples. It was for them to understand the nature of the kingdom of heaven. To the Jewish church, to the Jewish nation, the Pharisees, was it given? No, because what couldn't they understand? They couldn't understand his parables. When they rejected the second angel, Keep that in mind. When they rejected the second angel, they had no possibility of understanding the nature of the kingdom of heaven or the parables. So he's going to teach them in parables. So the Pharisees, do they understand the nature of the kingdom? Because what type of king are they expecting? They're expecting this temporal king, this mighty warrior king is going to stand up and deliver them from Rome. So the disciples, they've been trained by the Pharisees and what do the disciples expect? You have two different types of stories in this history. You have some people teaching there'll be a warrior king and then Jesus saying he's the sacrificial lamb. <coughs> so you have two different stories, two different narratives of what the kingdom of God is like, the nature of the kingdom. Because the Jews expect that the nature of the kingdom is this powerful Jewish nation state, don't they? 
So Jesus has to use all of these parables to try and teach them that this narrative they've been taught by the Pharisees is not true. The Pharisees are expecting a warrior king. Who else expected a warrior king? John the Baptist. John the Baptist expected a warrior king. So the disciples, they've been trained from the time they're little children. They've followed the, the scriptural teaching of the Pharisees. They expect a warrior king. They come through all of this history. They're expecting a warrior king. John tells them there's going to be a warrior king. And they come to this second angel that is not what John the Baptist described to them, is he? So... Jesus has to reteach them about what the nature of the kingdom is. And he's going to do that through parables. Parable after parable after parable to try and help them unlearn the misconceptions that the Pharisees held that John just naturally incorporated into his message. And it isn't up until, nearly up to the cross where he can tell them bluntly and still they don't get it and who refuses or cannot unlearn what he has learnt from the Pharisees and John the Baptist? Judas. Judas cannot understand the parables of Christ and he's unwilling he's unwilling to, under, to unlearn what he was taught by John the Baptist. When does that, when does the tipping point arrive for Judas? Foot washing, what we just did today. When he sees that service, he understands that to be, to be God does not mean to serve yourself, but to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven, this true kingdom, this kingdom is to be the servant of all. And that is not the nature of the kingdom of heaven that he had been led to believe in. And because of his unwillingness to learn, unlearn in the history of the second angel, he falls away. It's just he cannot... It's, it's, it's a truth too hard for him to bear. So what the disciples finally get at this deep understanding and grasp of at Pentecost, if we come back to our quote, when the Holy Spirit is poured out, we have that picture of the tongues of fire, the flames of fire. She, this sentence works as a repeat and enlarge, just a comma in between, not even an end. It's just one repeat and enlarge connected by a comma. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit's poured out upon the disciples. The Holy Spirit is poured out. They understand parable teaching. They understand Christ's parables. Holy Spirit is poured out. It's the same thing. The second part explains or gives clarity to the first. And then we also looked at Acts of the Apostles, 54.2. Acts of the Apostles 54.2 It is true that in the time of the end when God's work in the earth is closing, the earnest efforts put forth by consecrated believers under the guidance of the Holy Spirit are to be accompanied by special tokens of divine favour. Under the figure of the early and the latter rain that falls in eastern lands at seed time and harvest, the Hebrew prophets foretold the bestowal of spiritual grace in extraordinary measure upon God's church. So she begins by talking that about the time of the end, post-1798, when God's work on the earth is closing. Then she goes back to a figure of the early and latter rain, and then she says the outpouring of the Spirit in the days of the apostles, this understanding of parable teaching, as it's defined, was the beginning of the early or the former rain, and glorious was the result. But near the close of earth's harvest, a special bestowal of spiritual grace is promised to prepare the church for the coming of the Son of Man. This outpouring of the Spirit is likened to the falling of the latter rain. So she says this is the outpouring at Pentecost. There's rain. It's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. She says at the time of the end, 
there's an outpouring. It's the latter rain. It's an outpouring of the Holy Spirit and she connects the two. So if the early rain at, pa- at Pentecost was parable teaching, what must the latter rain be? <laughs> parable teaching. So when we come, when she's speaking at the, about the time of the end, what date is she using? 1798. That's the date she understands as the time of the end. So you can see this on a big scale, that all the way from 1798, it's all been about parable teaching. Parables are prophecies. Going to back to... Back to the definition of it, you can just see them as prophecy. But even through the whole of the Millerite time period, how do they know what, what they're living through? Through Matthew 25, the parable of the ten virgins, they understand their whole reform line through understanding the parable of the ten virgins, yes? Yes. So even through them, it's parables that have been unfolding. Line upon line in 19, that began to open up in 1989, it, line upon line is the essence of parable teaching. Jesus is saying the kingdom of heaven equals a net. We're saying that the fourth Diadochi war equals 2014. Can you see? We're making... Literal spiritual applications, lining up two things. We understand World War I, we don't well understand World War Three, so we line the two up over each other. The disciples understood fishing, they didn't very well understand the nature of the kingdom, so the two are lined up. Everything that we've taught, particularly under the falling of our own ladder rain, on this scale especially, is all founded upon parable teaching. Does that answer your question? How we line parable teaching up with Pentecost? Mm. Do we have any other thoughts or questions on this point? Yes, Brother Willie, and then Brother. Yeah, I just wanted to ask the clarification. So when you go to the record of Christ, which I understand is our primary witness, the record of the other, all else, and... We know that just before the cross, Judas leaves. But after the uh, after the cross, the one who replaces Judas is Matthias. So I just want you to understand when you come to the spiritual realm, that is the realm of the priest, uh, and the pain represents Judas in the spiritual leaves, and then who is going to represent Matthias? Who is going to I think we would need to have a closer look at that parable. I have some ideas, but if I give the wrong idea at this point in time, it could be not wise. So I think we need to investigate that further. Yes, my brother. I think I just a, a point to add, just from the logic that we are trying to give us from Acts of the Apostles. I was trying to view it from another perspective, which would also show us why we are saying that at the latter rain or at the middle of the we have parables. So there is always this logic that we always have. You can show that on one level, if you ask Helen why that Pentecost was the former rain, but if you deal with the line of Christ, also the disciples, you also show that when Christ resurrects on the first day, that he breathes upon his disciples. And that was the an opening of understanding of the parables that he had taught them. So if you view it in the dispensation of Christ, you view the early rain that they receive at the briefing is an opening of understanding of his parables and his teachings, and Pentecost becomes now the latter rain where they receive the Holy Spirit without measure. So if this was an opening of understanding, and from this quote, you show that it was also an opening of understanding of the parables. So you have a model in the history of Christ, early rain, opening of parables, latter day, opening of parables. Yes. We bring now that model to our history as the priest. We show that former rain is 9 11, which is an opening of parables. And now at our midnight crane, which is the latter rain, opening of the parables. This history of our early rain from 9 11 to 2014. 2014, our latter rain, 
2019. I like your point. Both early and latter rain both come with the symbols of parable teaching, whether you want to go back to Jesus breathing on them or even Jesus' ministry after his baptism. The early and latter rain both come with the symbols of parable teaching. And parable teaching is a characteristic of the second angel, the second angel arriving at 9-11. So Jesus arrived at 9-11, yes? The arrival of the second angel, the second messenger. But he's born here, yes? So at the time of the end, how many people do you have? How many people do you have? John and Jesus. You see two. But you only see in that history one, yes? But they're both here. They're both at the time of the end. And then when the second angel arrives at the baptism, his ministry doesn't immediately begin. He's going to go into the wilderness. But from this history, you see the opening up of parable teaching, yes? Question, time of the end. How many people did we have? Two being? Our time of the end. Let yourself be controlled by the parable, then find the answer. <laughs> One prepares the way, first angel. When did Elder Paminda become a Seventh-day Adventist? He's raised up at the same time. John and Jesus, you have two at the same point in time. We had two in the same point in time. You only see the first. It's not until you come to this history, the second arrives. He didn't begin his work at 9-11. By 2012, he sure has. And what is he opening up? Parable teaching. And by the time you get to the latter rain, it's all based on parable teaching because that is what Elder Paminda brought to this movement. End of ancient Israel, you have two at this point in time. People are only looking intently to one. End of modern Israel, we had two. People are only looking intently at one. Then the second angel, second messenger arrives, doesn't begin their job function straight away. It isn't until the first temple cleansing, which cleansed the temple. It isn't until the history of 2012 to 14. Did the history of 2012 to 14 cleanse the temple of this movement? When's the first great shaking we had? Started in 12, escalated 13, left in 14, path of the just, the temple was cleansed. Then in this history, escalating into the history of the latter rain, you have all of these parables, not just the parables, but the... the fascinating methodology behind them open up to this movement then right at the end what happens two groups of people one accept the second angel one accept the parables one rejects can't take the second angel with him can't take the parable it's this history of the end of ancient Israel and the end of modern Israel has so much for us for us to unlock that process is still ongoing, especially when we start to consider how as we, as we come into this history after the cross, one other point I want to make, this cross, the history of the cross, is what way mark on our time? At the cross, do you have two groups? You have Christ. Does it look like he just won? It looks like defeat. It looks like failure. Who else do you have? The Pharisees. What does it look like to them? Victory. Christ is on the cross. It looks like failure. The Pharisees, to them it looks like victory. And as they look at the cross and they say, we just won, what are they doing? Mocking. 
saying he said he was the Christ. Come to November 9 this year, what does Elder Jeff do? He sends out a mass email to a great many people and he says, look at that group over there. They predicted that raffia would occur on November 9 and nothing happened. It's incorrect. Never predicted raffia would be November 9. There's an element of conspiracy theories and disinformation, which is the theme of our line in his message. But at the same time, to us, to all of those who didn't understand the parables we've been teaching this year, they looked at this date and they said this looked like failure. So on the day Elder Jeff sends out that, that email in extremely mocking language, he said, look who they said they were. And they, their date just failed. I knew coming up to November 9 it wouldn't be that easy. Why? Because God had to give them a chance to mock. It couldn't be that obvious. This had to be fulfilled. This was expected. Does it pay to be at the waymark of the cross on the side proclaiming victory and mocking? No, it's just another telltale sign of being on the wrong side. And as we began to demonstrate yesterday, as we went through the fulfilments of Raphia this year, there has been no disappointment or failure of our prophetic message. So as we go through the history of the end of ancient Israel, as a parable, it tells us exactly what our time is meant to look like. If we're willing to build our house on this rock, it doesn't matter what storm comes or who says what or who leaves this movement, we're anchored. Because we're anchored not in a person but on a reform line. And we don't just have this line, we have, we have others. But this one being the end of ancient Israel and uh, out the end of modern Israel, it's the key, the key reform line, the history of success that unlocks our own. Do we have any other thoughts or questions on this point? Or we will close. If you kneel with me, we'll close in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for how you have led this movement. 30 years ago, plus a month or two, you began to open up these reform lines to us and all how they have the power to anchor us. We know the enemies are saying that all these people and those in this movement across the world are blindly following Elder Parminder and myself. But Lord, you know their hearts. You know what anchors them is the reform lines you've given us, the parables you've given us for 30 years. That's what made our house built upon the rock. In the last storm, it couldn't be swept away, not because it was built upon people, but because we built our rock, our house, on the firm rock of Jesus, the second angel and his parable teaching. I pray, Lord, that we will find ourselves more and more secured as we continue to to unwrap the parables that you have left for us. Thank you for the assurance that we can have of, of your blessing and your guidance. I pray for those that are still wavering. Lord, you know how hard some of these messages have been. Your tests are never easy. But I pray, Lord, that they will see the evidence through, through your parables, through your early and your latter rain. I put all of, all of us into your care and keeping. You know the commitments made today. The camp meeting is coming to an end. I pray, Lord, that you'll bless the work that continues in the life of each individual and also the work as it continues in Kenya. I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.